Vascular endothelial growth factors, or commonly known as VEGFs, are very important signaling proteins used to stimulate blood vessel formation from development to throughout our lifetimes. VEGFs are dynamic signaling proteins that promote the processes of vascular genesis and angiogenesis, which is the creation of new vessels from pre-existing ones. This signaling plays a major role in embryonic development and also plays a significant role in exercise recovery. Typically, these signaling proteins bind to a specific VEGF receptor, which then elicit a cellular response of vessel formation. The VEGF protein consists of four known subgroup families, VEGFs A, B, C, and D. The VEGF class that seems to have the most interest with regards to medical research is the VEGF A class, as it is thought to be the primary class that promotes systemic primary blood vessel development. The protein was discovered in the mid-1970s by Dr. Harold Dvorak. VEGF A was initially discovered with the name Vascular Permeability Factor, or VPF, as it was thought that it was the only blood cell promoting factor at the time. Dvorak postulated that our permeability factor allows for the tumor cells to become hyperpermeable despite numerous amounts of fibrin that exists. He then purified the protein and used antibodies on rodent tumors. As a result, he found blocked accumulation of fluid, which explains the permeability function of what is now known as VEGF. With this discovery, the purified VEGF A protein was found to be a dimeric 4-peptide chain glycoprotein, specifically a subcategory of cysteine knot platelet derived growth factors. Being that it is a cysteine knot protein, the sulfide bonds are present to hold together the beta strands of each peptide chain. Four alpha helices are also present in the combined quaternary structure. The protein itself is encoded by the VEGF A gene, which undergoes alternative splicing in such a manner to yield strikingly contrasting properties and expression patterns among other VEGF A proteins. This result may explain the several microangiogenic functions VEGF A can take on depending on its splice pattern. The discrete functions identified were to increase endothelial cell migration, to increase permeability of these blood vessels, and to increase endothelial production and proliferation to systemically provide angiogenesis throughout the body. As far as the mechanism goes for VEGF binding, VEGF A can bind to either of the corresponding receptors, VEGFs R1 or 2, located on the surface of endothelial cells. However, VEGF A most commonly binds to the VEGF R2 receptor to stimulate vessel growth. The other receptor, VEGF R3, is specific to another class of VEGF, and it is thought the pathway upon binding to that receptor stimulates proliferation of lymphatic cells. All of these receptors are tyrosine kinase receptors, which cause dimerization and activation by transphosphorylation. If we're still only talking about the VEGF R2 pathway, after this transphosphorylation step, additional signaling molecules known as VRAP start to activate, along with other associated proteins to yield the response needed for increased permeability for endothelial cells. Another cellular response designated by the signaling pathway is the activation of PLC gamma. This is because activation of the PLC gamma results in an increase in calcium levels in the cell, leading to the activation of protein kinase C. This cascade leads to an increase in cellular proliferation of endothelial cells. The NCK signaling molecules are also particularly phosphorylated, leading to activation of MAP kinase, which then moves to the nucleus of the cell and takes part in nuclear signaling. Once in the nucleus, MAP kinase activates various transcription factors and ultimately plays a role in actin organization. Another significant component of the pathway is the activation of SHB, which then proceeds with associated proteins for cellular adhesion of these endothelial cells. Through the cascade, other growth factors such as FNB2 allow for formation of these endothelial cells to form mature blood vessels. As briefly mentioned, it turns out that it is just a VEGF4-2 receptor where the signaling activation pathway occurs for normal angiogenesis, despite both VEGF4-1 and VEGF4-2 being tyrosine kinase receptors. So that brings the question, what is the significance of VEGF4-1? One explanation is that in some cases, VEGF4-1 can act as a decoy receptor in order to limit excessive binding to VEGF4-2, and this in fact happens in the case of embryonic development. This explanation further shows that binding to either VEGF4-1 or VEGF4-2 drastically alters the signaling pathway and therefore degree of vasculogenesis. In particular, VEGF4-2 signaling is used primarily for angiogenesis and needed vasculogenesis, whereas VEGF4-1 signaling is used primarily in embryonic vascular and blood cell development. The pathway for binding on VEGF4-1 in contrast to signaling via VEGF4-2 mechanistically requires two other signaling growth factors, VEGFB and PIGF or placental growth factor. Ultimately, this allows for induction of signaling proteins PLC gamma and a chain of other distinct signaling proteins ending towards MAP kinase, which amplifies the cellular response. Now, with regards to tumor cells, it is known that the signal of VEGF to stimulate angiogenesis in order to increase collateral vessel connectivity and therefore drain the necessary tissues and cells from their blood reserves. 
This makes VEGF a known molecular target for cancer therapy among other growth factors out there, as preventing vessel formation would allow for the blood supply with the necessary nutrients for tumors to be cut short. Hopes for this approach were encouraged by the success that anti-VEGF-A antibodies, as well as drugs targeting VEGF-A, had on inhibiting the growth of many tumors upon testing. These anti-VEGF antibodies are also currently being researched with respect to varying the inhibition of the VEGF protein in order to limit other harmful effects brought by tumor angiogenesis. Another clinical issue is overexpression of VEGF-A, which leads to neuronal disorders such as diabetes-related retinopathy and eye disease, rheumatoid arthritis, as well as macular degeneration of the eye, or age-related vision loss. The reason why neuronal eye issues are common to the VEGF-A overexpression is because these neurons also require vascular supply, and if significant blood supply is cut short by not stimulating vascular genesis enough or by promoting vascular leakage, certain cancers to the eye may be the result though drugs have been developed to slow down neurodegenerative diseases such as macular degeneration. Lastly, as mentioned earlier in the video, it is evident that the different classes of VEGF carry different functions with regards to angiogenesis, despite VEGF-A playing the primary role in blood vessel growth. VEGF-B, as we briefly discussed, is a protein that fulfills embryonic vascular genesis to completion along when binding to VEGF-R1. VEGF-C was found to uniquely contribute to lymphogenesis as it binds to the VEGF-R3 receptor, and VEGF-D plays a role in pulmonary angiogenesis through binding to the VEGF-R3 receptor as well. Most interestingly, there are also two other recent classes that are currently being researched upon, VEGF-E and VEGF-F. It is thought that they are encoded by viruses, and for the case of VEGF-F, it may be so that some of these proteins are encoded from snake venom. If this were to be the case, it would be very interesting to see what role these proteins should have should they be used for future drug development, in combination with the current research with VEGF-A. I hope this clarified the functionality of VEGF-A and its significance towards maintaining blood vessel formation as a unique and essential signaling molecule. Thanks for watching.